Today I'm doing a Game & Watch test. This is an excellent core that does an amazing job at simulating many of the 1970s, 1980s handheld games. Any of you that grew up at the time would have a bit of familiarity or hands-on experience with these. Anyways, I'm going to load one of the very first ones ever made by Mattel Electronics. This in fact came out before Mr. Gunpei Yokoi of Nintendo fame released his first in the Nintendo Game & Watch series called Ball in 1980. Unfortunately, that is not part of this collection, but it's a bit of uh, historical information there. So this is kind of the start of the entire game and uh, handheld trend here. We're gonna load Subchase, and I have to say right off the bat, many of these I have not played, so uh, you're gonna see me either fail miserably or just immediately get accustomed to the gameplay. I mean, some of these may seem like they have a minimalistic approach, but truly they have an extra layer of depth that you might play in a minute to learn and play for a lifetime to master. You'll see some of these like that. Anyways, you can push the start button and this will pull up your little control scheme. I'm able to move left, up, down, and right and push a fire button. And you can push select to navigate the interface of the game itself. So we have the on-off power switch. We're able to zoom in, cancel the zoom, I'm going to power it on now, and I'm going to say, from my experience with this right now, sub chase, it seems like I'm going to be trying to chase down subs. Let's see if I can do this. So these appear to be torpedoes that are shooting at me, and I would probably have to find the subs that are shooting them at me. I believe I found one. <laughs> So basically, it feels like I'm playing Battleship from the 1970s. But uh, we're going to move on to another game. And uh, one thing that's very interesting at the time is that uh, some companies would basically exploit the technology in such a way that they would use basically the same CPU and same ROM sets to save money in the end. And uh, here we're going to play a VTech game. We're going to try Baseball by VTech. And many of the VTech games had a similar approach where they'd have a basic left and right concept for controls. Here we're going to push and start. We're able to move left and right. And we're pushing a select. Hey, we can change the time if we'd like to. We can go to game A, game B. We can even power the light on. So I'm going to go to game B, which should be a slightly harder difficulty. And I guess if I'm playing this game in the, in the woods, I won't get lost because I have a compass at the top left here. Okay. So I'm apparently hitting baseballs. Some of these games will start out really simple and they'll get just, the patterns will become more complicated and I really love the kaboom for like Atari 2600 style gameplay in many of these. See they're throwing more baseballs at me now. And of course when you play games like this on the Atari 2600 you'd use the paddle controller and you know how them paddle controllers would work. You play them for a few hours and end up breaking them. Them controllers just broke left and right. But we're going to move on to another game here. We're going to play this game called Egg by Nintendo. And this game really did not sell that well. And I'll explain why in a moment after I test it out. Egg by Nintendo. And this uh, game, this is a perfect example of where uh, lack of licensing could truly hurt a game. This is just a generic character. And we're going to push start here. See the controls. We can move northeast, southeast, northwest, and southwest. And I'm going to do game A with the L1 key. So apparently I'm trying to stop the eggs from hitting the ground. I just have a generic character. I'm not even sure what animal this is. If it's a wolf or whatever the hell it is. But if I go back to the collection... Nintendo got a little smart here and wisened up and they redid the game with a Mickey Mouse license. They acquired the rights to use the license from Disney. And this game sold a hell of a lot better. And here we go. We're going to try the same game with a Mickey Mouse license to it. 
same controls. But here we're going to start the game by going to game A and game B with the select button. I'm going to go to game B and make it a little more difficult. Already much better with the Mickey Mouse license. More approachable in my opinion. And games like these are always fun to play. You, you would see what kind of score you could get and then you'd pass it off to your friend or somebody in your family and see how they do compared to your score. It, yeah, score-based games are really what made the you know 1980s so great. I mean, scores are not very prevalent anymore. I mean, a lot of times now it's, you just beat the game and have checkpoints. I mean, games are so much easier nowadays. Some of these games here require true skills. That's pretty much how games were back then. Anyways, this egg and Mickey Mouse were also cloned in Russia, and they were basically they reverse-engineered the games and. We're able to do a, many replicants of them. And I'll give you an example of that. We're going to try uh, Explorers of Space. And we know how this goes. You'd have your Zelda clones, your Metroid clones, your Mario clones. I mean, it's just how it is. I mean, you see something that's out there, even like a movie like Deep Impact, you'll have a movie like Armageddon. I mean, there's always some kind of clone out there. Edge of Tomorrow, Edge of Tomorrow movie-wise. See, same concept as Egg, and this is a Russian clone of it. Anyways, we're going to move on to a game that has a little bit more depth. You played at face value, and you wouldn't expect it to have depth. And this is made by none other than Bondi, which is one of my personal favorite video game developers. They made Monster Party, a truly underrated gem of a game on the NES. And of course, you can play it on the NES Classic and SNES Classic, as is now. But at face value, this starts out like a Kaboom-style game, and uh, but if you keep going on, you get a little bit of a slot machine mini-game, so there is more depth to this. So you keep playing this, you eventually unlock a slot's mini-game, so that's a pretty cool game too. I'm going to be going back to that. Now I'm going to load one that I personally played when I was a kid, and I remember this one. This is from the VTech series, of course. And I remember owning this game, and let's see if nostalgia was something I should forget. And I always got a kick out of how the animations were on the screen. They were present on the screen before you even turned it on. I always found that pretty interesting. Anyways, uh, we have the controls left and right, and I'm going to start game B. So I'm at the top of a tree, and I'm trying to keep monkeys from uh, getting my coconut side up here. So I'm basically playing an archaic version of Grand Theft Monkey here. Perfect game to get a kid, right? Show them how to use a baseball bat to hit animals, right? Anyways, we're going to move on to a few more games here. We're going to load this game that... Uh, let me exit RetroArch here. We're going to load this game that truly surprised me when I played it. I did not expect this game to be this way from the face value of what the game looked like. Never judge a book by its cover, or in this case, a handheld game. But uh, we're loading Galaxy 2 by Epic, and it looks like a pretty standard game here. But, when we power it on, we start it. We're basically playing a really cool handheld variant of a game similar to Galaxian or Galaga. This is really cool. And from what I gather, there's four different waves, and uh, one of them is very similar. The fourth wave is like a docking phase straight out of the game Moon Cresta. So this is definitely something I'll go back to since I'm a tremendous shmup fan. Anyways, we're going to go to another game that I personally owned when I was a kid, and I really love this game too. And uh, you're going to see a different type of technology here, something that's quite a bit advanced for the time. We're going to play uh, Donkey Kong Jr., and we're going to play uh, Panorama Screen. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm, pr I'm pr pronouncing that correctly. But again, we're going to be able to move left, right, up, and down, and push the jump button.
push in select, and you see these very nice colors on the screen. So it's looking like uh, my father, Donkey Kong, has a lock attached to him, and I have to get this key over here. And navigate this little uh, obstacle course of birds and all that whatnot, and get to them. Now I'm getting taken out by birds from the get-go. <laughs> There's a local pizza shop up my street, and I would always go up and play the real Donkey Kong Jr., and I remember really just being completely happy when I got this game for Christmas one year. So very nice colors here. I mean, truly excellent. I'm not sure exactly when this game came out. But I'm feeling miserably at it right now. It's been such a long time since I played it, but... Roughly, you want to get to the key and unlock your father. But we're going to move on to another game that's also a panorama game. And again, I mean, it, we may grow up on these Call of Duty games nowadays, and uh, you go back, and some of these games can really throw you off base with their true love, you know, truer, deeper layers of challenge to them. I mean, that Donkey Kong Jr. does have a little bit of a uh, hand-eye coordination and dexterity challenge to it. We're going to load, um... A Snoopy game here. Snoopy Tennis by Nintendo. Another licensed game, obviously. And of course, the license is working really well here. It's always fun to play with characters that you know quite well. Be a lot better than having some badger on the right of the screen hitting tennis balls. You got Snoopy and Charlie Brown here, so the license is working for me. And it's of the Game & Watch series. And many of these Game & Watch series games, not the licensed ones, of course, they would be on the uh, Game Boy systems as well, like uh, Lifeboat, for instance. I remember playing that on one of the Game Boy systems. And you go back, you're even seeing they're getting into the split-screen technology even as far back as then. You look at it sideways, you almost have like a, a pseudo-DS or 3DS in a way. So I'm looking at the controls, left and right. We'll do game B, have a little more challenge here. So we have a burning ship, and I'm trying to rescue people that are falling off, keeping them from hitting the sharks. And I lost one, and the shark got them, eating them alive. Okay. But uh, Lifeboat's a pretty cool game, too. Let's see what else we have to play here. We're going to do one of the other Panorama games. And I really got to look up how to pronounce that properly. We're doing a Snoopy with a panorama screen. And I'm really liking the little animations for this right off the bat. Left and right and a hit button. I'm going to start game A. So it looks like I'm trying to hit the musical notes. Before they wake up Woodstock or Lucy. And I feel it already, but that looks like a pretty cool gimmick for a game right there. And one thing that's very, very interesting about the Panorama games, and I talked to Luca, who worked on some of these simulators firsthand, and he told me about their technology. The, the same technology applied to the Panorama games as the Nintendo tabletop games. The LCD would be normal, just like other games, but... Through some very, very smart techniques, the LCD sprites were made negative first through a re reverse polarizing filter and then made colored through a clear vinyl sheet with colored spots. And lastly, the images are reflected through a mirror and heightened, lightened by the sunlight over the display. This is a very, very clever technique and it resulted in colored graphics without having to use an LED display or a VFD display. That would have obviously required lots of power and batteries. But now we're going to load one of the very first games that made me get into the whole handheld uh, simulator craze here. This is none other than Dungeons and Dragons Computer Fantasy game by Mattel Electronics. And this is basically an interpretation of the Intellivision game. And this game is, I would say, almost impossible to play without having an instruction manual. Very complicated game and 
A lot like the Sword Quest games for Atari 2600 as well, I mean. See, we have quite a few controls here. Up, down, left, and right. Move, rotate, and attack. And I, I do not think I would even have a chance of getting anywhere in this game unless I understand how it works. That's where the manual comes into play. But very, very cool game. Uh, very, very advanced and ahead of its time. You're talking where the average game was like Pac-Man on the Atari 2600. Yeah, Galaga, Galaxian. You had this RPG-style game with elements that was out way back in the eight, early 80s, late 70s. But uh, let's see what else we have here. And we do have one game that I really, really like on here. But I'm going to save that for last. I'm going to load this other game, uh, another version of Donkey Kong. And this is something I really wanted to have as a kid, but at the time, it was uh, kind of expensive. So even though I asked for it for Christmas, I ended up getting something else instead. Oh, here we have the Donkey Kong that looks like it's on the, an old primitive DS. That's kind of cool, too. But here, this is something I really wanted. I never got it. I'm sure it's pretty damn expensive now, even if I look on eBay. But this is uh, Donkey Kong... Like, almost like it looks like a mini arcade machine by Coleco. Powering it on. And I remember uh, Gizmo, either Gizmo or Stripe playing this game in uh, the Gremlins movie. <laughs> I'm feeling already. This is really cool though. I really wish I would have owned this game back in the day. So Donkey Kong, little mini arcade machine, and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure this or one other one of these mini arcade machines was in the Gremlins movie. I, I do distinctly remember them playing it. But it's the very, very last game I'm going to show today. It's going to be one that I really, really like and I really got to get used to it. It's called uh, None Other Than Tron by Tommy Tronic. And this is great. I've always been a big fan of the Tron license. I love both Tron movies. And this has like a, more than one face to the gameplay. You start out with the life cycles. And of course our controls are left, right, up and down and we can shoot. You start out on the life cycles, and this is quite a bit like Snake and uh, Surround. Surround on Atari 2600 was one of my very first games, and I believe that came out like 1978 or 1979. I got it in like 1982 or so. And of course, you're going to want to hold the speed button down here. Not to say, admittedly, I suck at this game. I'm not even past the very first life cycle level yet, so I'm going to have to play it a little bit more and strategize and get used to this game, of course. But many, many years ago, I owned a, an Atom computer, and it basically had a, a basic, a big several hundred page instruction manual with it on basic programming. And I was able to basically program the game surround that I played on Atari 2600 on the Atom computer and play it. It took me probably two or three hours to program it, but it was roughly this life cycle type game, right on an Atom computer. But anyways, if you're good enough, and I suck right now, if you're good enough to get past the life cycle stage, you get a couple more phases to the game. So, this game here is kicking my butt right now. I'm going to have to get used to it and see where I'm going wrong on the life cycle phase. But since I have another minute, I'm going to pick one other random game. Maybe we'll pick another Tommy Tronic game. Let's look through the list and see what appeals to me as something to try out for a minute here. And Banana is also another clone of the egg game. Just going through this list of games here. Some very interesting games. Some of these are duplicates, but they're on uh, different formats here. Like here you have the mini one. Here you have the tabletop looking one. Some Donkey Kong games. And this uh, one Donkey Kong game and uh, the Mickey Mouse Panorama are actually clones of one another. Some very, very interesting ones. Oh, I know exactly which one I still need to play. We're going to try out Motocross by Queen Tex.
Here we have the ability to brake and accelerate and move left and right. We're going to power it on. And start the game. So it's almost like an ancient hang-on game. Cue the super hang-on music, the excellent super hang-on arcade music. I remember many, many games from back then having this type of uh, same sound effect when you accelerated and decelerated. It was kind of interesting. Pretty interesting for what this game is, though. I'm going to make the very, very last game I showcase today, the great, great Penguin Land. But we're going to try Pac-Man by Tommy Tronic right before that. And that uh, Penguin Land will be the final game I show today. And you guys are welcome to try out the core. And if you have any problem running any of these handheld simulators, you can contact me if you have my information. We can move left, right, up, or down. We're going to go to pro mode. I'm not an amateur at Pac-Man. Let's see if I can... Navigate pro mode. And this might be a type of game where I may possibly want to zoom in. So we're going to try the zoom in mode for the helmet here. If you play some of these on the PC, they've actually been adapted to be able to use a a mouse, and if you play these on Android, there's going to be variants that come out where you could use a touch screen. So it would be like you're almost really playing the games when you're full screen like this. This full screen on your phone would be like playing the real deal. But this is Pac Man by Tommy Tronic. And the very, very last one I'm going to do today is going to be Penguin Land by another game by Bondi. What's interesting about this game is that it has uh, two side by side displays. And you're able to play either a penguin or a seal. One is more intelligent than the other. You can have your friend on one side and uh, yourself on the other side. I'm going to do something a little bit crazy here. I'm probably going to fail miserably, but I'm going to attempt to play both sides at the same time and see if I can pull it off at all. So I'm going to go to select two player here. I'm going to see what my controls are. Seal attack, seal right, seal left, penguin attack, see... I'm just going to do what I normally do with games. I'm going to try to play a game without reading the instructions. Then I'll go back later and actually read the instructions. So I'm going to power it on and have two-player mode. And let's see how this works. And I'm filling on one side already. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a little bit of getting used to here. But that's Penguin Land. I probably should have played one player mode on that. But uh, if you have a friend, you can play two players there. It's awesome. But hope you enjoyed this video. There will be more to come. And this is a truly, truly excellent core. Check it out.